Welcome to Central News, I'm Hilary Entwistle. In today's news, schools have been asked to design an eco-shelter to be a core element of the Planet Worries exhibition held in May at the Waikato Museum. The Chow Hill Eco Shelter Challenge is open to Year 5 to 8 students and requires entrants to design an eco shelter based on green design principles using recycled materials. Jennifer Hamilton, the museum's education manager, says students will be, give, will be given a site plan of the space and are encouraged to think beyond a hut or a house. So why a shelter? We really wanted students to think beyond a hut or a house. A shelter could be either, but it also could be a place for animals, or maybe we need to think about an earthquake shelter. The New Zealand Historics Places Trust has mixed the old with the new when it recently launched a new smartphone app for the Waikato Wars. The project includes a smartphone and iPad driving tour app and brochure, new site signage and artwork at key battle sites in the Waikato, a website hosted by Hamilton and Waikato Tourism, and an education resource for secondary schools. Amy Hobbs, manager of the Heritage Destinations, says the project is a collaboration between the New Zealand Historic Places Trust and Ngāmuka. The events that took place during the Waikato War significantly influenced New Zealand as a nation and the people that we are today. So New Zealand Historic Places Trust saw this as an appropriate time to start telling these stories, particularly with the 150th commemorations of these battles coming up over 2013 and 2014. So what we've done is tell these stories in an accessible way for all New Zealanders, particularly the younger generation of New Zealanders. Retail sales volumes in December saw the biggest increase in six years, with Tauranga residents spending a total of 689 $1 million on retail, more than $60 million extra sales than a month before. After adjusting for seasonal effects, the volume of total retail sales increased 2.1% compared with September last year. Business Statistics Manager Blair Cardinal says the total sales volume and sales value trends have seen a consistent increase since low points in 2009. Blair says the last time sales volumes rose more than 2% was in December 2006. Now for our region's weather. Hamilton, your Tuesday will be fine with light winds. Your expected high is 27 and an overnight low of 11. Tauranga mostly fine with a few cloudy periods and a southeast breeze. Your expected high is 24 and an overnight low of 14. Just ahead, the housing market in Hamilton. Welcome to Central News on TV Central. We've heard so many times recently that it is a buyer's market. So Amy caught up with the General Manager of Harcourts in Hamilton to find out about the current housing market in Hamilton. Well, the Waikato, right through Waikato, is very, very busy at the moment. We've got a real big resurgence coming back in the rural lifestyle um, market, which we haven't seen for many, many years. And uh, with the, as far as the Hamilton market goes, where we're predominantly working, uh, this company's working, is uh, very, very busy in the residential market. Big resurgence of um, first home buyers coming in because of the nice, easy uh, to get interest rates and mortgages at the moment, so we're seeing a big resurgence of them. And the other thing that's really firing that market away is also is a lot of um, investors coming back into the market. We're seeing investors coming from all over the uh, country and think that Hamilton's a very good place to live. The Waikato wide, I'd say we're very, very busy, but traditionally this time of the year, if we're not busy this time of the year, we'd be worried, but this year is a lot busier than what we've had in the past five or six years. So what are the average house prices in Hamilton and where are they sitting in compared with their rateable values? Okay, well the um, average price, uh, median price in Hamilton over the last 12 months has been 330000 give or take. So it's risen a bit and it's gone up and down over the year, but at the end of the year, for a year, a, a 12 month take is about $330,000. As far as capital values go, well, they're all over the place. Capital values are up and they're down. We don't actually take a lot of notice of capital values. It's actually a rating value, which the council have done with a valuer. The market actually sets the value. So a valuer driving down the road and looking at property and saying and putting a, a blanket value on them really doesn't match the uh, market of today. The old government valuation years ago, you could have a little bit of uh, credence on it, but the capital, uh, the uh, rateable value today really isn't something that we look at a lot. 
How do our average house prices compare on a national scale? Oh, well, we're pretty good. Our average price is a lot further down than the average scale. Uh, you go to Auckland, you're looking at 600 around there, Christchurch over four. So we're pretty affordable here. At $330,000, it's still very, very good buying, and that's why we're seeing a lot of the investors coming into this market, and also the first home buyers see us as very attractive. The interest rates with our average price matches a, a very, um, what would we say, a, a very attractive proposition here in Hamilton at the moment. And the outlying areas as far as Cambridge and Mathematics in places like that. There's some very good buying right through to Rotorua, even the Bay of Plenty, there's good buying. So our prices compared to our closest big neighbour, which is Auckland, we're very attractive. So what are some tips for our buyers and sellers? Okay, well, okay, let's have a look at the buyers first. I think you've got to know your market. Whichever market you're in, you've got to know the market. You've got to know the little piece of the market that you're looking in, it might be 400,000 to 450 or whatever, or, or 200,000 to 250, you have to know that part of the market a lot better than maybe the agent does, because a real estate agent's looking at the whole market, he's looking at the whole spectrum of the market, but if you're just looking in one little area, make sure you are the expert of that area and of that price range, and then you won't actually, uh, what would we say, skin your knees. You actually need to be an expert. Do your homework, have a look at a lot of properties before you make the decision and just start, you'll, you'll get a feel in the end of what's good value and what's not. Try to buy something with a little bit extra. So if you can buy something in, say, a three bedroom house that might have an office or a three bedroom house that's got a large garage, just look for something a little bit extra when you're out there buying and that will be better when you go to sell in the future. As far as the sellers go, it always comes back to one thing, make sure your property is well presented. Don't put it on the market until it's well presented because the first lot of buyers are your best buyers. As soon as the market hits the market, sorry, as soon as the property hits the market at the moment, it gets onto the websites and we have a big influx for the first two weeks or so. If your property is not ready, well, you're gonna miss a lot of opportunities. Dress your house for sale, make sure that everything is right, and don't overprice it. Price it for the market. What we're seeing at the moment, the big swing towards the auction system where the, where the market actually prices the property and the agent isn't. And so you're going in there with no, market, no price on the market. That is maybe in this market a good place to be. Now you mentioned some tips for the buyers, so how about our first home buyers? What are some tips for them? Well I'd say again if you can get something a little bit extra, uh, first home buyers are certainly uh, out there. There's a lot of, there's a lot of competition because you're not only competing with first home buyers, you're competing with investors as well. So first home buyers, if you can buy something in a good area with a little bit of extra, that will be good going forward. But don't forget, do your homework before you go to the market. Do your pre, go, go to your bank, go to your uh, mortgage broker, make sure you know exactly how much you can spend, ex exactly what price you can go to so there's no disappointments later. It's a lot easier to go in there and look at, say, a $300,000 house and buy a $300,000 house and going at a $350,000 house and then find when you find one that you fall in love with that you can only go to 300. Go and get pre-approved, do your homework, get everything set up before you start looking, then there's no disappointment. Again, get out there, look at the open homes, make sure you know the market you're looking in and then you'll be a very well qualified buyer. So is now a good time to buy an investment property? Well, I'll tell you what, a year ago was a better time, but now is actually a better time. It will be in another year's time. Investment properties in Hamilton are, are certainly a, a very good proposition. Um, there's a lot of people coming in. Hamilton's a transient city, and I'm only talking about Hamilton where we're pro predominantly working, but it goes for the whole of the Waikato, but Hamilton City is a, is a transient city. So there's people coming and going. We've got a big university here, we've got a big hospital, and a lot of industry doing very, very well. We're seeing a lot of people coming into the city for year contracts, two year contracts, and that drives the investment market. I believe that if you're going to get into an investment, Now's the time to do it. It would be nicer done done a year ago because things are starting to heat up a bit, but there's a lot of people looking for places to rent. There's still some very, very good buying in the marketplace for investors. It's, it's, um, it's, it's competitive, but it's good. Now you mentioned that the market is heating up, so you see a rise in Hamilton prices? We're not seeing a rise in prices, what we're seeing at the moment is a rise in volume. Now if something that comes on, um, that comes into the market which is sought after, yes, crazy prices are being paid, you might get two or three offers, or in the auction room you get something uh, around the Hillcrest area, which is around the university, there's a lot of people looking at that area, we do get high prices in those areas. But in general, volumes are lifting, but um, prices are, are, are starting, to, starting to strengthen, but they're not going crazy like they are maybe in Auckland and Christchurch. Next, the water restrictions. Welcome back. 
The Masamasapiako district is under water restrictions. We found out what this means for you from Mayor Hugh Virgo. Uh, the situation is, is not critical yet, but if we don't get any rain in the next few weeks, they, we will be starting to get in problems. Uh, each of our three towns is different. Um, Matter Matter, for instance, we take water from the springs in the Kaimais. We also have bores in the town here, and uh, we are managing, but uh, yes, supplies are limited. Um, Tierra, we can always take water out of the Waihau River. It costs us more to pump it up to the treatment station and then gravity feed it down again. But there's water in the, the Waihau. Uh, Morrisville comes from a retention dam, and that is getting very low. So um, we're asking everybody to conserve water as best they can. Uh, the other thing, of course, is the treatment stations are going absolutely flat out trying to treat the water that's being used. So does that mean Morrinsville is actually worse off than the other three towns slightly? Or? Yes, it is. Um, and the, uh, the dam is, is some um, you know, 20, 30 kilometres out of town. So you've got one pipeline coming into there, you've got the, the one source. Fortunately, the um, Fonterra have got a dairy factory in Morrinsville. They've got a bore in there, they treat that water, they use that for part of their use in the factory. And because the farmers are in the drought, they are making that water available to help us out in Morrinsville. Well, it's funny you mention that because I heard this morning that uh, the that dairy farmers have applied for Waikato to have that drought status. What's the what's the situation with that? It's a recognition of the drought that's out there. And if you have a look around the dairy farms, there's absolutely no grass. Everything is brown, and there's nothing in there. Now, this is early for the farmers to go into a drought season. Um, I own a dairy farm myself, and I go out, and, and the cows are um, basically on dust. So you have to feed them if you're carrying on milking them. So you have to buy palm kernel from the likes of Swaps and RD1 and the other merchants, um, or maize or some alternative uh, feed source, which is very, very expensive. And in some cases, if that's all you've got to feed them, it costs you more to produce your milk than uh, what you get from your return, which means the Waikato will start drying off all their cows, which means the impact on the whole of the Waikato financially, if there's no dairy check coming in for the next uh, six months, will be severe on all the businesses in the towns and everywhere else. And I guess pushing that price of milk up, maybe even? No, it probably won't put the price of milk up, but it, it will have an economic effect on, on uh, the towns and the cities because the farmers simply, a lot of them are maxed out to their overdrafts at the moment. They've still got bills and uh, their normal, their main cheque comes in uh, October, November, and that's a fair way away to try and struggle through until then. Mm, it doesn't sound like good times. So what does this actually mean for, uh, for urban residents when there's uh, water restrictions? We're asking all the, the urban residents to um, minimise their use. Now, it's not a blanket across the board. Council took a lead situation and said we will stop uh, watering our town gardens. Now, good idea, bad idea. Um, you can't really say to your community, you're not allowed to use uh, sprinkler systems, but the council will because we're more, more important than you. So the decision was made that we've removed the hanging baskets, we've stopped um, uh, putting the irrigation systems on. But having said that, you talk to the likes of the, uh, the bowling clubs who say, well, do you want us to stand there? We can stand there with a the hose all night watering our greens, which seems a bit stupid. And it, it's use your common sense. If you've got a reason, restrict the amount of water that you use um, and try not to just use irrigation all the time. So how will the council actually ensure that people are sticking to this ban? Oh, it's interesting. Um, we have had complaints about people who turn their sprinklers on at uh, night time and leave them on and, and um, you can see the, the greenness on their properties as opposed to others. However, having said that, we are aware that there are some residents who have put in rainwater tanks and the tanks are collected from the rain. They've got their own pump system and they want to keep their gardens going and uh, that's neat and neighbours should ascertain first whether the people are using town water or their own uh, rainwater for their gardens. So on the so what are some tips to kind of save some water? You can save a lot of water if you're conscious of it. And people that live in the country area <coughs> generally are trying to save water all the time, whereas people in town, um, you know, water is cheap. It, it, we sell it at something like 98 cents per cubic litre. Now that's a uh, metre, one metre by one metre by one metre. That, that's, that's cheap. So therefore in town, why should people uh, try to conserve water? In the country, you know you've got a tank and when it stops raining, you ain't got any water. So it's a matter of being conscious of it, turning taps off when you don't need to, um, take shorter showers, take showers instead of baths, um, you're washing, do your, your washing on cold water and, and minimise what you're doing, all those sort of things. Now moving on to the uh, other council topic, as you're currently taking submissions for the Manga Te Paru Recycling Centre to remain yeah. where it is. Yeah. So what are you asking for feedback on that issue? 
Right, we've got our recycling centres in our towns and <coughs> the rural area rightfully said to us, what are you doing to give a service to us in the rural areas? So we've done a trial, we did a couple of trials in different places. Mangatapari was one where we put some uh, recycling bins out there and said to the local people, uh, try it, see what you think. Um, at this stage it's only a trial, there are only some uh, wire cages there. And we're now asking, do you think it's a good idea, yes or no? Um, if we put something permanent there and fenced it so that it was probably tidier, because uh, yeah, it is untidy now and then. Um, and lastly, of course, uh, would you be prepared to pay for the service? And most of the, oh, it's about, most of the people that have come with submissions at this stage says, yes, it's a good idea, but no, we don't want to pay. So what does the council do then? Uh, yeah, that's it. So what will the council do to ensure that that place is kept tidy though? Oh, it's in a little uh, lay-by area that is, is quite uh, suitable for that to happen in there. Um, yes, now and then people will dump TVs and other rubbish into that. It's a recycling place, it's not a total rubbish um, collection place. And it's a matter of when we are aware of that, the um, contractors will go and clear the site. What we're proposing if we did it permanently was putting down a concrete um, base to it, um, putting some wire cage right around and have your, your wire receptacles inside the area as opposed to uh, in the open. And visit mpdc.gov.nz to find out more of any of those topics discussed. Just ahead, a Hamilton artist and the bus stops. If you've just joined us, welcome to Central News. Tagging has become a nationwide problem on our streets, but one local man has set his artistic talents to the task of cleaning up our streets. Jeremy Shirley explains his current piece. This wall was uh, painted for the Glenview Community Centre. Uh, I approached Ro, who runs the show here, about a year ago, just asking if she'd be interested in a mural. And she said she was, but they, that they didn't have any money. And so uh, I, I had a community service day and I decided I would use it for this project. Yeah, so, yeah, it's really worked out well. And where did the idea come from to create this particular piece of art? This particular piece, actually there's various icons and symbols that I've been developing for use in the public space that, uh, that can appeal to a wide variety of people in a cultural background, uh, from little kids to older people. Uh, there's natural elements and yeah, just various symbols that, that can speak broadly. So when did this flair for art begin? Yeah, I guess, I guess throughout my life I've been uh, interested and, and taken notice of, of, of wonderful paintings or drawings. Um, I've always been able to draw, so it's kind of been my strength. So I've sort of followed that, you know, I've been lucky. Now you've created pieces similar to this all over Hamilton. Can you tell us a bit about these projects? Over the last couple of years I've been putting proposals to council. Initially the, the idea was uh, tagging mitigation or to reduce tagging because that is a way to get backing. You know, and um, the, the, the bus shelters, which was last year I did 12, uh, that, that's been really successful. So. They've given me another contract this year and I've just started my f the first of 14 yesterday. So uh, that amongst other projects, yeah, there's, there's lots of opportunities in Hamilton. It's a blank canvas. And how do you hope these projects might deter taggers? Well, they're really vibrant and colourful, but they're also painted largely with aerosol spray paint. And so a lot of the taggers and graffiti artists, or, uh, they recognise that. Uh, but it's not, it's not graffiti as such, it's, it's, the subject matter is different. They're not, maybe not quite sure what it is, and so they leave it alone, they respect it. It's got a similar energy, you know, to some of the graffiti. Um, but, yeah, I call it urban contemporary art. So do you do any work with youths on anti-tagging? Uh, not currently. Um, right now I'm focusing on doing as much work as I can. I'm really enjoying painting and creating as many yeah, different images as I can. But um, I have worked with youth and also inmates, mm -hmm. um, youth in, in prison and various groups. There's a huge need and I'm approached regularly by organisations. Um, yeah, however, uh, I will go back to that, but right now 
I'm just really busy creating. And how do the teams enjoy the projects? Very much so, yeah. I, I found the inmates, they're largely quite a talented bunch in, in the visual arts area and um, various other areas, but yeah, they're really receptive and um, it was a very popular class while, while I was there. Um, as I say, uh, some of them are quite amazing with regards to natural ability. Uh, but yeah, there's a big there's a big need for for a lot of young people. You know, they, they really want some guidance, and there's there's lots of work. I would love to be able to teach uh, the the process. You know, the prep and how to how to make a painting last, how to, the composition, colours. Yeah. So there's a lot. Um, but as I say, I'll have to come back around to that. Yeah. And there, there are people doing good work in the city. Yeah. So instead of doing some tagging, they might be following in your footsteps. And well, that's right. Yeah, yeah. By putting the work out on the on the street, um, where they can see it, uh, I think that, that it does challenge them to go beyond, you know, just tagging on a fence yeah. to developing uh, a style or a theme or a colour, you know, colour plan, and, and putting their best work out there mm -hmm. and being proud of it rather rather than not not so proud of it. So, what other work have you been involved in over the years as an artist? Uh, yes, as I say, I, I taught taught um, in a prison, and uh, when I left school, I, I went sign writing. Um, I've spent the last five years at the Waikato Museum, um, managing the uh, workshop there for the exhibitions team. So setting up exhibitions and deinstalling, um, making objects to support treasure and painting and so forth. So that's very creative, uh, creative role it was. But uh, now I'm a full-time artist. Again, so yeah, painting lots of pictures. Um, I did a sculpture last year, large scale wooden sculpture for the Waitakarudu Sculpture Park. So have you got any other artistic ideas coming up in the pipelines? I lay awake at night dreaming about them, but uh, <laughs> it's really wide open in, in Hamilton. And in fact, it's quite exciting and uh, I feel lucky because um, yeah, I do have lots of ideas. And there, there is, for any other artists out there, there, there is, there is money there, there is finances there. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just coming up with really good proposals, putting your work out there and, and delivering. Yeah, it's about finding a niche in the market, isn't it? Yeah, 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 it's exciting. Make sure you check out these art pieces next time you drive through the city. That is the news for today. We really want you to be involved. Just like us on Facebook and let us know your views. If you have news, including your own video and photos, go to our website and hit upload. Thanks for joining us. I will be back tomorrow night with more guests from in and around the regions. I'm Hilary Entwistle. Have a lovely evening. This has been an Alpha Media production, a division of Television Media Group. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.